Chapter 18 The Pit and the Cloud Nabat scurried along in front of Tamural, wincing as his backside caught the tail end of his commander's whip once again. He fumed, but knew better than to complain. That would just land him more abuse, plus the attention of the powers who love to join in a good reprimand. Attention of the powers who love to join in a good reprimand when they weren't otherwise engaged. Instead, he tried reason. Perhaps if I explain, I can gain Tamuril's favor and a chance to complete my assignment. Nabat shuddered in the familiar darkness leading to Sheol as he thought of the alternative, dubbed like Sheroth. Sheroth should have been among them this eve, but Tamuril blamed the lesser for blotching up the last encounter with the Watchers. He told Lord Lucifer that Sheroth's blunder permitted the Watchers to escape unscathed. So Satan promptly turned Sheroth over to the powers for rebuke. The powers thought it great fun to... The powers thought it great fun to throw lessers into the boiling pools and bet on what types of disfigurement the drenching would cause. Or worse yet, Lord Lucifer might order him sent to the depths, where there were rumors of a fathomless pit. No one knew for sure what horror dwelt there since the unfortunate lessers who had somehow returned raved with madness to find out what happened after he had surprisingly made his way back from the pit to the Grand Hall. But his efforts to communicate only increased Sheroth's incoherent babblings and desperation. Those who returned were only good for one thing, digging. Sheroth now joined the ranks of the despised of the despised, the cursed lessers who dug and dug with the threat of the pit and the sting of whips, driving them deeper and deeper into Sheol, and Tamuril chose Nabat to fill Sheroth's vacant post. He'd welcomed the opportunity to leave the confines of Sheol for the surface. He dreamed of the promotion, the chance for, screamed Tamuril as he snapped the cord against Nabat's bottom, shaking him out of his reverie. Do I look like I have time to break your back? Pick up the pace. The powers are waiting. And you'd better have a really good reason why you let Enoch escape or I'll toss you into the pit myself. Nabat increased his tempo and said, I will hurry. I will not go to the pit. This is the last time Tamura will blame his incompetence on someone else. Nabat scurried into the Grand Hall, slowing when he saw the gathering before him. This was more than just the powers looking for a diversion. It seemed as though all of Sheol was looking for a diversion. It seemed as though all of Sheol itself waited for their arrival. Legions of lessers and the upper echelon lined the risers carved out of the walls. A large iron contraption was alone in the center of the room. Bars crisscrossed each other to form a thatchwork wall with from it. Spikes poked through the openings with painful precision. Behind this, Satan sat high on a throne as elaborate and ornate as the lessers could construct, waiting. Nabat, so glad you decided to join us," said the great leader as he leaned back and crossed his arms behind his as he leaned back and crossed his arms behind his head. I was beginning to think I had offended you in some way. Lucifer motioned to one of his lieutenants, who promptly drug a heavy chair and placed it squarely in the center of the room. Please do have a seat. I would hate to keep you waiting. Oh, of course, right now. Nabat bowed low, staring at the paved floor, thinking, stalling. Uh, Lord Lucifer, a thousand pardons, said Nabat, slowly rising, but I wouldn't dream of sitting in your presence, not when Commander Tamuro has spent the past day chasing us lessers around as he tried without success, without success to have the man Enoch captured. It is he, added Nabat with a flourish of his maimed hand towards the iron chair, who should be seated. Indeed, said Lord Lucifer, hopping up from his throne and turning to face the surrounding horde. Well, I must say that is surprising. I do have only one chair available. I think I would rather hear my commander explain this catastrophe. But I am just, so I will not make the decision on my own. The great leader called out to the multitude, raising his voice over the snickers already erupting in the hall. Tell me, my brothers, who should I question? The lesser? The cacophony exploded with glee as feet stomped and fists pounded, adding to the ruckus. Tamural! 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 Tamural walked calmly over to the chair. His face, a mask, a stoicity, covered the hatred seething inside. He allowed himself one last glare at Nabat inside. 
he allowed himself one last glare at Nabat as he whispered quietly, I will return. Now, Tamuro, said the great leader, tell me, why do I not have Enoch seated before me? I am extremely disappointed as we went to so much trouble to have this chair. You, unfortunately, have the task of convincing me why I should not do to you what was intended for him. Tamuro swallowed and opened his mouth to answer. Only a thin rasp came out in response. He cleared his throat and tried again. Oh, uh, well, Lord Lucifer, you see, cleared his throat and tried again. Oh, uh, well, Lord Lucifer, you see it was. It was an unpredictable and unpreventable mistake. Ah, so you do have the sense to admit you made a mistake. The great leader flicked his hand and on cue a metal track popped up from the floor, latching on to the metal chair, latching on to the metal chair. As to it being unpredictable, perhaps, but unpreventable, no. No, my commander, I am not convinced it was unpreventable. Are any of you convinced? He asked as he lifted his arms to the gathering. No, no, no. They, ch they chanted as they pounded their feet and for some what amounted to feet in rhythm. No, my Tomuro, unpreventable is simply unacceptable. Surely, surely there was something you and L.O.M. with excelling strength and cunning could have done to prevent a mere dirt beast from escaping. Or are you suggesting that he is somehow greater than? No, no, not at all, Lord Lucifer said to Muriel quickly. Of course not, but, but this was the doing of the beloved. Don't you dare say that name in my presence. The great leader's face turned to fury as he flicked his hand again. This time the chair lurched bang. To Muriel's mouth dropped as he clutched the sides of the chair. He was about to stand when circular rings protruding from beneath his seat and the arms opened with a click and snapped shut, forcing him to remain seated. Tamuro took a deep breath and began again, his, his facade of indifference once again in, and again, his, his facade of indifference once again in place as he attempted to correct his blunder. I tell you with a surety, my lord, that the great deceiver himself gave the man Enoch power that was not released even to us. The one called Enoch merely spoke and he spoke and what? What happened? He walked slowly over to face Tamuro, who was firmly secured and sweating in his chair. Tamuro preferred the noisy rabble to this. He twisted in his chair, but not much. The spikes surrounding him prevented that. He will hate the truth. But if I withhold, he, he will torment me more in his head. Enoch only said he wanted to leave and, and he vanished. We, we had him and he just disappeared. No, no, that's impossible. Lord Lucifer mumbled and turned away. He flicked his wrist again absently while he paced. A circular track popped up and closing the space, popped up and closing the space around the chair. Not one in the assembly dared to speak. He stopped abruptly, swinging around to face Tamuro again, but then hesitated and stared at Nabat, who had somehow inched as far away from Tamuro as he could without notice. Now Nabat trembled just outside the perimeter of the circuit of the circular track. Nabat, the great leader said curtly, is this true? Yea, my lord, he speaks the truth, said Nabat in a voice so small it made his monstrous form ridiculous. Very well, then, said the great leader with another flick of his wrist. That is all. With that motion, the ground holding the contraption gave way and plummeted to the depths below, sending a burst of steam into the great hall. Tamuro's scream echoed throughout the chamber. The great hall was quiet as Lord Lucifer resumed his seat on the bejeweled throne. He surveyed the beings around him, curling his lip at the sight. These pit him. I will surround myself with beauty once more. But until then, I must suffer their presence. Moloch, he yelled, give word regarding your mission. Yes, my lord, said Moloch as he walked, tail slinking in tow toward the throne. He bowed low, then raised himself to stare at the great leader, eye to eye. Well, at the great leader, eye to eye. Well, well, said Lord Lucifer, you must have good news indeed to parade yourself, dog that you are, in front of me with such confidence. Yes, my lord, these markings are but a small price to pay to serve you, but I assure you, 
You will be most pleased, relishing every second as he enticed Lord Lucifer with the bait. Surely my time has come for elevation, now that Tamuel, that snake, is gone. Really, said the great leader, sitting up with interest. Please proceed. Moloch leaned forward with a grin as he eyed the powers seated directly beside the throne. Moloch paid off. The childling is coming. Nema screamed as she doubled over with pain. The Medici circled her, mumbling over her in their strange way. She could hear some Jaza outside laughing with the Elohim and elders, his voice boisterous and jubilant. Her Elohim and elders, his voice boisterous and jubilant. Her head reeled as the next contraction hit. Someone was talking to her. What? Push! Nema stared at the woman with glassy eyes. She strained to hear. Why is she so far away? She heaved against the pressure in her abdomen, her face contorted and way. She heaved against the pressure in her abdomen, her face contorted and flushed with the strain. She blinked rapidly at the dark shadows flickering across the sunlit room. What? What did you say? They were talking to her. Nema. <laughs> no, Nema, don't stop. Push! ordered the Medici. I can see the... Nema obeyed the command and gave one last thrust. She could hear the baby crying. Oh, she tried to sit up to reach for her baby, but the women wrapping up the bundle kept shaking and calling her name. Please, please, I want to see my baby. She spoke. Nema, <laughs> they can't hear you. Nema screamed, struggling against the icy hand's grip. A gross, misshapen head smiled crookedly and yanked her away. Help! Stop! Get your hands off me! Nema, get your hands off me! Nema yelled at the top of her lungs. Please, Mother, help me! Nema looked over her shoulder as she wrestled, reaching for Mother Zilla. Mother Zilla was crying over the beautiful girl lying motionless on the cushion. Captain Simjaza was holding a baby. Her baby. Laughing. Simjaza! The Medici pulled a blanket over the girl's face. No! Tamuro groaned in agony. Molten liquid poured over his body. He thought the fire would consume him, but it did him no such favor. Only tore. He tried to hold on to the fragment of thought, but could not. He squirmed and struggled in the cruel seat. It too was merciless. Though he knew there was no hope, he could not control the desire to wrench away from the bonds holding him. So he writhed and twisted again and again, jerking against the restraints. Nor could he resist the urge to breathe. Though nor could he resist the urge to breathe. Though he needed no air to sustain him, so he sucked in gobs of the searing lava. It burned through him. Why am I not destroyed? The almost indiscernible sound of a bond breaking severed the thought. He was free. One by one, the restraints were dissolving. He was floating, were dissolving. He was floating, floating up, up towards, or no, was he falling? Tamuro lost track of time and even a sense of himself. There was only pain and this sensation of nothingness. Had it only been a few seconds or millennia since I faced Lord Lucifer in the Great Hall? He tried to remember, but the terrible heat seared his memories too. Faced Lord Lucifer in the Great Hall. He tried to remember, but the terrible heat seared his memories, too. They fell from his mind like jagged shards of disbelief, leaving only the reality of this infinite torment. If I can just remember one thing, maybe I can hold on to reason. Now, yes, uh, what is my name? My name is Tamural. Just then, Tamural burst forth from the boiling lake, sputtering and spewing the soupy mix of fiery fluid and earth. Would-be tears evaporated from Tamuro's eyes as he inhaled the steamy stench of methane and sulfur. Bursts of fire exploded about him as the two volatile elements exploded about him as the two volatile elements collided and fought for control of the sparse oxygen floating about the expansive cavern. Tamuro bobbed precariously in and out of the lake. Each time he broke surface, he swung his arms out to steady himself. He squinted through the reddish haze, looking for the boundary to this madness. He swirled from as far as he could see to his left and to his right with sameness, so oppressive that it reminded him of a liquid desert, rippling tirelessly. No, no, this can't be. There must be. Tamuro stilled himself, treading, staring, hoping. There above the mist, he saw it, hovering. 
off. Tamiro focused on the bluish cloud. It must be cool in its mist. If I can reach it, maybe. Tamiro swam furiously towards the cloud, ignoring the agony of each stroke. As he neared his goal, he could make out the shoreline in the form of a cliff. Tamiro drug himself forward, slushing through the marsh until he drug himself forward, slushing through the marsh until he collapsed onto the coarse gravel. He winced. Something sharp sliced his knee. Tamuro clutched a handful of the sandy stuff, panting as he looked straight up at the cloud, incredibly high, but directly above his head. Leading to it was a wall of granite, ominous and black, likely smooth. The surface sparkled like the stars of heaven. He stood slowly, putting a hand over his eyes as if the motion would improve his sight. It looks like it is moving. Tamuro walked towards it. No, it's not moving. They are. Dozens, no hundreds of man-like forms, scaled and then fell off the cliff again and again. Some reached almost the top before tumbling to the rocky shore. He watched them, their burnt flesh in shreds, screaming and cursing as they plummeted to the floor. Now he heard them plainly. Why didn't I hear them before? The cacophony was deafening. He wanted to ask them what was inside the cloud. Did anyone know? Excuse me. Can you tell me, said Tamuro. The charred man cursed and mumbled, ignoring him completely, but not before Tamuro got a good look at its face. Oh, Tamuro gasped. I know him. That's, that's. Tamuro shivered violently, despite the heat, when he realized he could not remember his name, not remember his name, no matter how hard he tried. All he could think of was the cloud. He looked at it, longing. He could almost taste it. Tamuro stared into its wispy depths and caught a glimpse of something. No, no, it couldn't be. A lump of recognition grew in his belly, making it ache. I must begin scaling the flat surface of the cliff, using two jagged rocks he'd picked up from the dreary beach. The translucent pointed edges that sliced his knee now served him well as he drove them into the surface and picked his way upward. He ignored the snarling forms doing the same thing, hurling all within his path away from the cliff. Doing the same thing, hurling all within his path away from the cliff. If anyone makes it to the cloud, it will be me. Tamuro panted more from excitement than exertion as he closed the distance between him and the vision. His eyes glistened. Tears fell down his parched cheeks. He could see it now. Through the vapor, it was a lake. He could see it now. Through the vapor, it was a lake crystalline and pure. It was surrounded by lush grass, green as emeralds. From the covering, flowers of every kind sprung forth in radiant glory. It was the glory from that other place. Tamuro laughed, his eyes bulging, and reached for it just before his hand moved out from the mist. The perfection of that image startled him. Tamuro lost his grip, but not before he felt the sting from the touch of that cloud and the knowledge of who dwelt there. He screamed his name as he fell back, back, back towards the boiling lake. Adam! Over the gently flowing stream, staring into the shallow water, pouring into the river Gihon, her face streaked with tears and a smattering of dust, peered back at her sadly. The forerunner had tossed her a couple of times, a rare occurrence, but fortunately she'd somehow managed to catch the spirited creature by its hairy tail and, re and remount. It now stood a few lengths away from her, drinking gratefully from the brook. She shook her sandy curls, still wild from the day's ride, and tried to pick out the fine bits of dried grass clinging to it. She gave up the futile task and instead tossed a pebble as far as she could. It landed pitifully, not even midway, not even midway across with a plop, to far aside, and leaned back onto a large rock dotting the bank. Even my aim grieves today. Nema is no more, and now they send that poor girl back. Anami sat perfectly still next to the woman. He didn't know why he bothered, didn't even know he existed. Just before the tribunal ruled over the man Rafas regarding his wife and daughter, Amadisi brought word to Mother Eve that Nema died during childbirth. Despite the news, the elders ordered Rafas, Medisi Yabesheth, and their daughter Shalal to return to the city of Nod. After the allotment, overwrought with grief and furious about the decision, fled into the wild lands alone. Anami immediately asked Captain Azam if he could follow her. You know how impetuous she is, Captain. She might do something foolish, like try to rescue the girl Shalal. That's what Anami gave as his reason, but 
he'd also wanted to make sure she was okay. But he'd also wanted to make sure she was okay. This one is unlike all others. She is special. He'd caught up with her just in time, too. He saw her tumble from the horse and intervene just in time to break her fall and slow the animal down. Finally, she'd stop to rest. Tafara threw more pebbles last as she thought about what might be happening to Shalal right now. Then her mind wandered to her cousin Nema. She remembered how they danced and laughed that night of the ceremony. Nema would be alive now if it wasn't for that watchersome Jaza, and now she is dead. Nema is dead. She pressed her lips together to still the trembling. Lips together to still the trembling. I should never have left her. I should have made her leave with me that eve. I, I knew something was wrong and I left her. It is all my fault. Tafara pulled her knees into her chest to quiet the soft sobs that escaped anyway. Anami placed a hand on Tafara's back and began to sing. He repeated the little way. Anami placed a hand on Tafara's back and began to sing. He repeated the little melody focusing his thoughts towards her. But the girl cried for a long while, then finally was still, very still. Hmm, are you sleeping? He looked at her. You are very different from the other daughters of Eve. Daughters of Eve. Very beautiful, but different. Is that why you are alone so much? He touched one of the stray curls gently, stretching it out to its full length as he removed the straw. He did this again and again until finally he removed all the grass from her locks. He had been so engrossed in the task, he hadn't noticed her head shift slightly. Tafara's head was no longer down. She was staring into the lake. She was staring at him. Tafara peered into the clear watchers of the lake, willing herself not to move and break the peace. She closed her eyes, inhaled deeply, and then exhaled slowly. There's that smell again. Honeysuckle. She's so peaceful here. She stared deeply into the water. It glimmered. Tafara pointed her finger into the multicolored display in its depths. For a moment, she forgot about her sorrow as curiosity pushed the sadness back. The water was alive with color. She swirled her fingers around. The colors were still there, but there was nothing in the water. Around. The colors were still there, but there was nothing in the water. Tafara smirked at her reflection and started to sit back. When realization stole up her back, leaving every hair on end, she sat very still. Then as fast as she could, she whipped the bow from her back and thrusted it directly towards the cause of the strange spectrum to thin air, leaving just a visage of a being in front of her. It was a man. Tafara's jaw dropped. He was the most beautiful man she'd ever seen. He was absolutely still, as if his stillness would make him invisible once more. I can see you, she said, dropping the bow aimed at Learn well, the man said. Who are you? I? Are you one of them watchers? The man pinched the tip of the arrow between two fingers and slowly forced it down, smiling at the girl's frown as she struggled to keep it in place. I am one of those watchers, and you really shouldn't use that maneuver against use that maneuver against everyone you meet. Familiarity will ruin its effectiveness. What do you know about? I know everything about it as I created that technique. Who do you think taught it to you? No one, you insolent thing. I thought of it all by myself and perfected it just a few just a few days ago while raising a brow. I suppose you are also going to tell me you struck that rebellious wolf in full gallop, merely wounding it enough to scare off the pack all by yourself. Tafara's eyes narrowed. Have you been following me, watcher? Not exactly. Although I have made myself available at some very opportune moments, very opportune moments, you know, you really should. So that day on the Cliffs of Nod, that was you? You almost killed yourself with that foolish stunt. Good thing I caught. And the eve of the celebration of the new sun when I almost drowned diving through the Gehon to the Cave of Treasures, that was... You almost drowned? Anami with curiosity. What happened? How did... Well, you don't have to sound so excited about it. I did almost lose my life. I would think that watchers would be more... Do you always interrupt, asked Anami, ignoring Tafara's smirk as he pressed on. It is a most horrible habit, you know. Normally it would prevent me from having a desire to confer. No, normally it would prevent me from having a desire to converse with you. However, you are quite sporting and I must know how you dove through the Gahan. So what happened? Tafara waited, simply staring at him. 
He may be gorgeous, but no man disrespects a Medici. Oh, she said, respects a Medici. Oh, she said after a long while, do I have your permission to speak now? Anami laughed. I will ignore your temper, Medici Tafara, in exchange for your tale. Yes, please tell me everything. Well, said Tafara, mustering all the drama of the tale-bearers she could, past the full moon, and the woods were thick with... Medici Tafara, said Anami, raising a finger. If I could trouble you... What? I thought you wanted to hear the story, and now you... You know, no story is complete without a little something to sip on, he said with a grin. It somehow widens the understanding, and... And... Oh, all right. What do you want, said Tafara as she began rustling through her pack. The drink of power, maybe some tea with Alru, or... No, no, I was thinking of something like a cup of Ketu. Ketu! exclaimed Tafara as she tossed her pack aside. You! You be the one stealing my Ketu! A little, because yours is the best. For once, Tafara had nothing to say. It is hard to stay angry with this one. What be your name, Watcha? I am Anami. Well, Anami, I guess I'll give you a cup of Ketu in exchange for saving my life. Tafara laughed and began pounding the beans for the brew. In that, in that case, you owe me two cups. I'll make the fire. Onami sat staring into the dark night, listening to the sounds of the Gihon. Tafara had told the tale of the dive to the Cave of Treasures and a good many other adventures, while Anami sat and listened intent until the fire died and the embers from the ash cooled. Finally, the girl fell to sleep. She did have one request, though. That's what he thought about now, as he watched his aura swirl again, casting a rainbow of color on the clear waters. I am afraid of the dark, she said. Will you hold me until I fall asleep? He didn't answer. Hold me until I fall asleep? He didn't answer. He merely gathered her into his arms and sang softly until her eyelids stilled and her body grew heavy with the weightlessness of sleep. She had been asleep a long while now, but he still held her. He really wanted to put her down and return to Captain Azam, but found it difficult to do so. Will you go down then? No, there is no need for it, answered the beloved. Yet your spirit hovers there, shielding him. Yes, and it is just, answered the beloved before General Michael could raise the question. Of course, my lord, I only meant, your loyalty is not in question, friend. Lieutenant was aid because of his intentions, even without asking. Dear General, the motivation of his heart speaks, and I answered. Michael nodded with satisfaction. Ah, yes, it is apparent to me now. How long shall this last, then? Should we alert the watchers? That is not required. Should the necessary moments arrive, how long shall this last then? Should we alert the watchers? That is not required. Should the necessary moments arrive, I will address them. Yes, very good, my lord, said the general as he peered into the depths of the crystal sea before the throne. And what of the others? The childling is come, and more will come forth soon, shall all there are lessons to be learned. Let them explore this path and gain wisdom. But the sons of Adam will not be able to prevail against... The sons of Adam are not the only ones who need understanding. Let the Elohim learn, too. But what can these childlings teach, these offspring who are forbidden? You shall see in due course, General. All things have purpose. My father and I have seen it aforehand and made our plans. Our spirit, too, agrees. You speak of Adam's prophecy, then? Indeed. Both sides shall multiply. Both sides shall strive, and then, and thus spoke the general gravely, yes, Methuselah, Enoch's offspring is the warning. They must say it, reminding themselves every time they speak his name, and then the end shall come, for that is the meaning of it. How long then? Methuselah shall have long life, giving them time and us room to act. I'll show you. The prophecy is at hand.